Today in the Sermon on the Mount, we're gonna be talking about the spirit of anger. Spirit of anger. Now, I wanna make a distinction though because in the Bible it talks about righteous indignation. This is not righteous indignation because righteous indignation is when you're upset about things that God is upset about, but you don't stew and you don't handle it the wrong way. Matter of fact, it empowers you to do the right thing for God's behalf. That's righteous indignation. This is not what what we're dealing with, what Jesus is talking about in a spirit of anger here. So Matthew 5, 21, he said, and he's referring to the Old Testament, and he's referring to the Ten Commandments. He says, you've heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to justice, a judgment. But I say, if you're even angry with somebody, you're subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court, and if you curse someone, you are in danger of fires of hell. <clears throat> now, let me clarify, this is, you know, I've called people idiots before, I'm not going to hell, um, because I can't help how they drive in front of me, amen? Um, <laughs> totally justified. Um, no, what, what, we're, what we're dealing with is when we're cursing a fellow brother and sister in the Lord, when we're demeaning their humanity, we're demeaning who God has made them as a human. Now, we can judge the actions, but we should not judge the person. Okay, there's a difference between that. God is the judge of the person, but we can judge people's actions. We can judge their fruit, right? By their fruit, we shall know them, okay? But I wanna break this down because anger is a very dangerous toxin. It's a very dangerous toxin. And if you leave it to its own advices or its own device, you will absolutely destroy your mind and your heart, Now, this kind of anger is when uh, we would say that it's rekindled or it's focused on a person. And and so when your anger dies down, then you start thinking about it again. And if you've ever seen a fire that kind of burns down and just the coals are there, but if if you break it up and throw some more kindling on it, it it bursts into flames again. And this is what is happening in some people's lives in a spirit of anger because they get calm and then they start ruminating on it, nursing it and rehearsing it over in their mind, and then they get angry again. You can be looking at somebody, they're not even doing anything, just sitting there, and they'll get flushed in the face, and their, their, their composure will change, and it's because they're, they're rehearsing, and they're reigniting that flame of anger inside of them, okay? Now, anger is the seed to murder. It is the pathway to murder. You cannot physically murder someone until you murder them in your heart. You cannot physically commit murder until you've committed murder in your heart. You've walked it out in your heart. And this is the way the pathway starts, okay? This happens in Christian circles. I wish they were no longer in the church. I can't stand that person. I wish they were no longer in the church. Then it goes, I wish they were no longer in the city. Can't stand them. I wish they were no longer in this state. I wish they were no longer in the nation. I wish they were no longer in the world. I wish they were in hell. Matter of fact, I'm gonna send them to hell. That is the pathway to murder. It is baby steps, if you watch What About Bob, it is baby steps getting you from something that seems innocent to something that you're sitting before the judge being sentenced for murder. It is the gateway, it is the pathway. So murder is beginning in the heart before it is carried out in the hands. And anger left unchecked can open the door to the demonic. Some people say, well, they were a Christian. How how did they end up down that way? Somewhere along the line, they did not process their anger and deal with it, but they allowed it to fester, and then they opened their heart either to demonic oppression or demonic possession. Now, some of you, you come from these sterilized religious experiences where you think God is out there and we're in here. We are living in a very spiritual world, and most people in America that have demons, they're just highly medicated. Some of you were married to one of those. Okay. So, oh, too real? Okay. Anger, remember, left unchecked, opens the door to the demonic. 1 Samuel 8, 6, this is talking about Saul. He was the king. And what happened was he messed up, he disobeyed God, and then God now anointed David to replace him. But now Saul is still the king, okay? 
And, and David is getting some victories in battles because he just had killed Goliath, okay? So it says this. It says, when the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed the Philistine, women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. They sang and danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals. This was their song. Saul has killed thousands, and David has killed tens of thousands, okay? So they're giving credit to Saul, but they're really giving credit to David. And it says, this made Saul very what? Angry. Come on, say it again. Angry. What's this? They credit David with tens, uh, ten thousands, and me with only thousands. Next, they'll be making him their king. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Jealousy is the seed or the gateway to anger. So check this out. He has opened his heart to the spirit of anger. He's not dealing with it because of his jealousy. And we go from this verse right to the next verse. Here's the next verse. Watch what happens in 1 Samuel 18.10. The very next day, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelms Saul. Now let me, let me explain this because the Old Testament writes things in a certain perspective. God did not send a demonic spirit to, tor to torment Saul. God, this means that God pulled back because of Saul's decision and he couldn't protect him. And so therefore this demonic spirit had an open door because of Saul's decisions and now he's being tormented. He's being oppressed by a demon spirit. A lot of people open doors that God is not gonna intervene because he will not mess with your free will. Look, if you want to mess your life up, God's going to let you. He is not a puppeteer. He is not going to control you. You are not a robot. He gives you the decision to follow him or not follow him, to listen to him and to be led by the spirit or to be led by the flesh. And so here we have it. He's tormented by this demonic spirit. And he began to rave in his house like a madman. Sounds like some of your relatives, right? rave in his house like a madman. David was playing the harp in each day, but Saul had a spear in his hand and suddenly hurled it at David. What is it? Attempted murder. Of course, not for the king because he could do whatever he wants, but this is attempted murder in the eyes of God. How is he trying to murder him? Because he had an open door that opened a spirit pathway to demonic influence that tormented him that caused him to do something that he would have never done before this day. So how do we handle anger? How do we process anger biblically, spiritually? Do we just say, don't get angry? Everyone, don't get angry. That's not realistic because we're human. So it's not a matter of don't get angry, it's a matter of how do we handle it when we do get angry? How do we handle it? Because if you don't handle it right, the power of the subconscious becomes very powerful. Studies show, and, and Yale Scientific and, and, and Scholar Blogs, they've done some research in this, and they found the power of your subconscious. If you're watching, uh, let's say, a very horrific movie, something that, that, that's dealing with trauma, murder, rape, some kind of horrific experience, your subconscious, when you've watched it four times, your subconscious feels as though you've lived it. And here's the other problem, because if you're watching a scene like that and you lean into it, then you suddenly open yourself up to become either the murderer or the one being murdered. And you see the event from that perspective it's in your subconscious. This is how powerful it is when you play your anger over and over. You rekindle your anger over and over and don't process it. You become very dangerous to that person. And this is why we cannot afford to have a short fuse. Some of you have a short fuse. Have you ever done firecrackers, M80s? You want to make sure you got a good fuse on that, right? Why? Spoom, ow, you have one finger to wave with. <laughs> and so many people in church only have a short fuse. But if you surrender your heart to the Lord, if you're reading the word of God, allowing to be led by the Spirit, he will grow your fuse. But you know, so many, so many Christians are more like nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin was a very powerful substance, but it was very volatile. And they were using it for mining, mining gold and things like that. And so 
you know, it's a, it, it was in a gel or a liquid format, and if, if there was too much vibration, it would just automatically explode. It would detonate, like some people you know. The, 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 the most little effect has a devastating consequence. Oh, my goodness, what happened? Boom, 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 just detonated all the time. So then what they did was they added... Um, sawdust and wrapped it, and they called it dynamite at the time. Now it's a different substance. But then dynamite left setting too long begins to cause the nitroglycerin to pool at the bottom, and now it separates, and then it becomes very volatile. Again, your, your anger left unabated too long, you will become very dangerous. I think we as Christians should be more like C4. C4 is like Play-Doh, it's like clay. Oh, this is fun, you can throw it, you can, you can hit it with a hammer, you can toss it off a building, you can do all kinds of things, you can make little bunnies and all kinds of shapes. But you know what, it won't be devastating unless you intentionally detonate it with a blasting cap. In other words, you're in control. Do you have power? Do you have the ability to do things? Yes, but you're in control on how you detonate. Yes. Now, Titus 1.7 talks about an elder or a leader in the church. And this is where I love so many, so many Christians in church. They sit there and go, Phew, glad that's not me. Because, you know, if you're a leader, you have to do all that stuff up there. But I'm just a Christian. I'm not even a disciple. I'm just a Christian. I'm going to heaven. I'm just a Christian. Not a disciple, and I'm certainly not a leader. Let me help you with this. If you're a Christian, you're a leader. Why? Leaders influence. If you're a parent, you're a leader. If you're a person and you have breath in your lungs, you're a leader. You influence other people. So you have this responsibility. So it says, you must live blameless, a blameless life. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered, short-fused, volatile. You know, leaders that are very volatile, people don't like to be around them. If you're volatile, you're like wearing an S vest everywhere you go, a suicide vest. You're just like, <laughs> boom, <laughs> And everybody around you is devastated. And so they, don't want, to, they, they want to stay out of your blast zone because they see you as a dangerous person. So we cannot be quick-tempered, and it says you must not be a heavy drinker or violent. Look, when you are a leader, you have to be very careful that you keep your control and your composure. The moment that you become inebriated, I don't care what substance you're dealing with, the moment that you intoxicate yourself, you're opening yourself up and, and you're diminishing your capacity. Look, if you shouldn't drive a car, you shouldn't be a parent if you're inebriated. If you're drunk and you're around other people, you're dangerous. Look, a lot of people, when they get drunk, they, they're, they're, their vision is distorted. Ugly people look good. Oh, wow, longer I'm looking at you, the better looking you're getting. Literally, we were in Montana ministering, and, and he took the pastor there. He took me to this great, the best steak restaurant I've ever had, Montana. I walked in, and they had this sign on the on the bathroom wall, it says, beer, helping ugly people have sex since 1921. <laughs> and I'm like, huh. <laughs> but see, if that is a reality, how much more should we be aware of our faculties to make sure that we're in check and we're in control of ourselves. When we're around our children, when we're around our family, when we're around some of the most precious possessions in our life. See, as a leader, you have to realize that you're the thermostat. I know as a leader, I can walk into the staff and I can change their temperature like that. If I'm mad, they'll get mad like that. Why? That's just the way it works. Because when you're a leader, you set the temperature of the room. You're the thermostat. Everybody around you is the thermometer, and that's why we have to be so careful about our composure. Because the greatest challenge that we'll ever face is leading ourselves. Wow. You can't control other people's anger, you can't control other, you can't lengthen other people's fuse, but you can work on your own fuse. And that's why, you know, I wanna look back at Moses. <laughs> Moses, here's the guy that 
his first leadership interaction ended in murder, okay? So he had an anger problem. He had a temper problem. Why? Because his first moment to interact as a leader, he sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave, and what does he do? He takes him out and buries him in the sand. Well, I took care of that. No, he ran for his life. God's like, I need to get you out of here. You need to be with some sheep for a while. If you can't lead sheep, you can't lead people, okay? And so got him out there, and so now he, he does signs through God, you know, signs, wonders, and miracles are manifesting, and, and Pharaoh releases the children of Israel. They go through the Red Sea, and now they're in the desert, in the wilderness. God is bringing fire by night to keep them warm and, and cloud by day to keep them cool. He's bringing manna, and, and now he wants to show the people, God wants to show the people that he's going to give them water from a rock. Another miracle. And so you have to understand you got three million plus women and children, three million men plus women and children, and livestock. That's a lot of water. That's probably a big rock. Amen? And so this is what God tells him to do in Numbers 20, verse 8. He says, you and Aaron must take the staff and assemble the entire community, and as the people watch, remember, as the people watch, you're on the stage, Moses, speak to the rock over there, and it will pour out its water. You will provide enough water from from the rock to satisfy the whole community and their livestock. So he wasn't even supposed to go over the rock. He was just supposed to speak to the rock so that God would do a miracle. So Moses did as he was told. He took the staff from the place where it was kept before the Lord. Then he and Aaron summoned the people to come together and gather at the rock. Now he has an audience. But here's the problem. He has been burning inside. He is so ticked off at these people. He's so mad at the Hebrew children because all they're doing is complaining after all the miracles, all the good things that God is doing, and now he's taken it upon himself and he's ticked. Now watch this. This is where he diverts from the plan of God. He says, listen, you rebels, he shouted. Must we bring water from this rock? And then Moses raised his hand, struck the rock twice with the staff and water gushed out. Look, he didn't speak to the rock. He went over and he struck the rock. Now, this is not a happy Gilmore. Tap, tap, tap it in. He's not tapping the rock. In the Hebrew, when it says struck, he's beating it as though he wants to kill the rock. He is now given his whole composure. He's thrown it out the door, and in front of the whole assembly, he's lost his cool. And he's defamed God in the process, and instead of the people seeing God's miracle, they're seeing his temper. Anger tends to be displayed on a stage for other people to watch. I mean, some of you, when you were children, you probably, maybe some of you had abusive parents. Maybe you had an alcoholic parent that was very abusive, very mean. Anytime they raised a hand, you ducked because you didn't know if it was gonna be a hit, a slap, or a hug. You witness that. Here's the problem with anger. When we give in to anger, it causes us to lose perspective, and it distorts the truth. The truth is God wanted to do an amazing miracle, but his anger clouded the miracle. And it tends to blow things out of proportion. Then we forget our values. We forget about what's most important. We end up fighting for the wrong things. And instead of fighting for people, we fight with people. And God, as a leader, has called us to fight for relationships, not against them. And then we close our ears and we lose focus. Tony, he's a taekwondo master, eighth degree, Sifu. That's why I sit next to him, because he told me to. <laughs> He's so humble, he is. Um, but he will tell you, if, if you get into an altercation where you have to defend yourself, the last thing you wanna do is lose your temper. Because when you, look, everybody has a game plan. You can go in, you can, you can go through all your practice and your routines until you get popped in the nose. Your plan goes right out the window. Suddenly, anger wants to take over, and then you lose composure, you lose control, you lose focus, and that's what the devil wants us to do, is to lose control and stop listening to the voice of the Spirit when we should be listening to the voice of the Spirit right there in that moment the most.
Now, what you got angry about, whatever got you angry, may not justify your anger. I've gotten angry over things that I had no justification to be angry over. It's because I had a short fuse. I didn't have enough sleep. I didn't this. I didn't that. But suddenly we think the whole world stinks around us. It's just us. And just because you got angry doesn't mean that you need to stay angry. You don't need to keep refeeding it and thinking about it. In other words, you need to put a timer on your anger. You know, if your anger lasts longer than it takes to boil an egg, you're in trouble. Get an anger timer out. Eight minutes, set it down. Go, to, go into your bedroom, jump on your waterbed, splash around, punch your pillow, scream in your pillow, let it out in a safe place so that you don't hurt others that you shouldn't hurt. You gotta put a timer on your anger. Psalm 37, eight says, stop being angry. Just because you get angry doesn't mean you need to stay angry. Stop being angry, turn from your rage, don't lose your temper, it only leads to harm. And that's why it says in Ephesians 4, 26, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. I like what Phyllis Diller said. She says, never go to bed mad, stay up and fight. <laughs> if you don't know who that is, she's got hair like my wife right there, Phyllis Diller. <laughs> we were at an event one time and I said, have you seen my wife? And he goes, well, what does she look like? She looks like Phyllis Diller's hair. She goes, oh, she's over there. <laughs> Look, inevitably, you're gonna get mad and you're, wanna, you're gonna wanna fight at the worst time. And it's usually around bedtime when you're tired and what, your vision is distorted and everything is getting out of control. And so early on, uh, I learned not to go to bed mad. Well, not to go to bed when both of us are mad because I went to bed when I thought I was over it and she wasn't, and she woke me up with a glass of water. It was exciting. Um, I learned a lot. So now I understand what to do. If you go to sleep, you get baptized. So <laughs> now, now I just say, are you good? I love you, do you love me? Or am I gonna wake up in heaven? <laughs> you know? So, so no, in, in reality, there's times that you just have to say, hey, time out, look, do you love me? I love you. We're not going anywhere. We know we need to work on this. So let's put it on the table, on, not on the nightstand, let's put it on the coffee table way downstairs. Let's go to sleep, let's get some rest so we can get some better perspective, a little time over this, and then we'll go back and we'll talk about it and get a resolution on this. So many times we need to put a timer on it and we need to be able to, to, to make sure that we don't go to bed angry, we resolve it. And many times the resolve is we resolve to resolve it in the morning. And then you have to process your anger safely. Process your anger safely. Psalm 4, 4 says, don't sin by letting your anger control you. Think about it overnight and remain silent. You know, anytime that there's a suspicious package, they bring in the bomb squad, right? And I'm gonna blow my nose. That'll deal with your vanity in front of 400 people. That's exciting. <laughs> they, they clear the area, and then they have proper procedures to make sure that they handle it to mitigate or minimize the potential of damage, okay? So when you get angry, you need to go to a safe place to detonate. Because anger always has consequences. Look, some people will not be able to handle your level of humanity in that moment. They'll never forgive, for, forgive you or forget your weakness in that moment. And more people will see it than should see it. More people will feel it than they should feel it. More people will remember it than should remember it. The, you know, this is where we have to be sure that when you get upset, your explosion goes up, not out. So back in the early days of, of bomb squads and things, they would have a trailer that would come out and basically it was just a, a tub that went up on the sides and there was no top on it. So that way they would put the device in that and if it blew up, it blew up, not out. 
It was a controlled explosion to minimize the damage. Look, when you're going through something, you need to take your anger up. I was with a parent that lost a child, and I told him, I said, hey, if you're upset, be upset. If you're mad at God, go ahead, be mad at God. Tell him whatever you want. Why? Because God is God, he can handle it. He can handle your humanity, he can handle your weakness, he can handle whatever your emotion is because he loves you unconditionally. Just go ahead and let it out so that way you can gain some better perspective. So many times we, we, we try to muzzle people, oh don't say that, don't say that about God, don't say that, what are you doing? Well you don't know how big God is. Proverbs 14, 20, 29 says, people with understanding control their anger but a hot temper shows great foolishness. So we have to control our explosion. We have to control how we process our anger. Doesn't mean you can't be angry. You just have to handle it right. And if you don't, sometimes there's additional consequences that, that could be very embarrassing. I've told this story a few years ago, but I think it bears repeating. It's about a husband and wife that they were associate pastors at a church down in Texas. And um, they, they kind of were not happy with each other that evening because they were talking about finances. You know, that's always fun talking about finances. And, and well, you're spending too much on the credit card and da, 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 and they're going back and forth. And, and so it's kind of like a, a church event that night. It's a formal event. So she's getting ready and she's got this really nice dress. She hadn't worn it before. It was brand new. And so they're, they're snarking at each other and snapping, and bep, 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 you know. And, and so she's got her dress on and, and she goes, do you think you can zip my dress up? Do you think you can at least do that? Well, yeah, I think I can. <laughs> You know, and he grabs a zipper and he zips it up and then zip, 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 zip. Now he's getting smart with it. Zip, 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 and broke it. Yeah, that's what he said. <laughs> now she's ticked. Oh, she's upset. This is her brand new dress. She hasn't been able to wear it. This is the only thing that she has ready to wear. Now what are we gonna do? I'm so mortified. You know, she's so upset. He's like, oh, there's an El Pasco. Collect $200 tonight. And so he's just stressing. And so they have to get some pins and pin it together. And she's mortified. Now she has to wear this shawl that her grandmother made in Texas in the summer. So they get in the car. And of course, there's no conversation. It's just nice and quiet. All you hear is the AC. <sighs> They're driving and she's mad and he's mad. And oh, it's bad. They get out of the car and they walk in and suddenly their church face. Oh, hello. <laughs> oh. You know, they're just putting on the show. They're so happy. They're so happy. And people walk up to her and say, oh, what a beautiful dress. Oh, I love your shawl. Oh, yes, I just thought I'd honor my grandmother tonight and wear my grandmother's shawl. Isn't it so beautiful? I'm just so happy, da, da, da. And now they're in the car and they're going home and she's mad and he's mad and it's not good. And no, collect $200, no passing go. He went straight to jail. So he wakes up in the morning and to some noise and she's shuffling around and she's getting ready and you know how sometimes, you know, there's getting ready and then there's getting ready loudly. <laughs> she was getting ready loudly and he wakes up, what are, you, what are you doing? She goes, I'm going shopping. I'm gonna put it on the credit card. I don't care what Dave Ramsey says. I'm <laughs> buying me a new dress and you're paying for it. So she storms out, you can hear the car. <laughs> out she goes, he's like, oh, whatever, you know. Guys, and so she goes shopping and she comes back and she drives in the driveway and her husband's under the car changing the oil and, and she looks at him and all she sees is just his torso sticking out, just the lower half of his torso. He's up, you know, and she walks up and she puts down her bags and he's, he's laying there on, you know, like this and, and she walks up and she goes, oh. grabs his zipper, zip, 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 grabs the bags, walks in the house, and her husband's sitting at the desk paying bills. <laughs> she drops the bags and goes, what, 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 are, you, what are you doing? It's like, I'm paying the bills. But who's under our car? He's like, well, that's Larry. He came over to change the oil. 
no. So she's freaking out. He's like, what? What is the problem? And so she tells him, and he's like, you did not. You did not. So he's trying. She's like, you, you go out and fix it. You fix it. He wants to get out of jail. So he literally walks outside, and he sees him laying under the car, and he's like, Larry? Larry, and he bumps his leg. He's not moving. He's on one of those crawlers, you know? So he grabs his heels and rolls him out, and he's out cold. Got a big old knot on his forehead. And he's like, Larry, come back, Larry. And he goes, well, oh, he's like, man, man, you wouldn't believe it. Some, some lady came up, grabbed my zipper, and started zipping on it, freaked me out. I looked up to see what it was, hit my head, knocked myself out. And he's like, I heard about that woman. She lives way down the street. (laughs) (laughs) It's funny, but anger left unchecked can have serious consequences. It could bring serious embarrassment, shame. It can create situations where you can't undo what you've done. You, once something explodes, you can't put it all back together. But I'm telling you, the Spirit of God will help guide you and direct you. If this is a proclivity in your, in your life, You need to stay in the Word of God and you need to read the Word of God. And as you read the Word of God and surrender your heart to the Word of God, you're gonna find that God begins to extend your fuse because you're giving him something to work with. And then you're gonna look back maybe a year or two down the road and you're gonna go, wow, that just happened and I I would've punched that person. Now I wanna pray for him. Wow, something, something's different in my life and it's because you did something different in your life. You put Jesus and his word in you. The washing of the word, the reprogramming of the word of God renews your mind, changes the patterns. And look, I understand some of you, you might have come from abusive situations and and, and so familial-wise, the, the way that you were raised, it's kind of ingrained some patterns in you and some behaviors in you that, well, that's the way they reacted, so that's the way I'm gonna react. And, and, and it's like a generational curse, but you can break that curse. You can surrender it. Your, your generational tree can fork spiritually and you can have a new outcome. You don't have to be in despair. You don't have to go with what all the experts say that you're... you're hose the rest of your life. No, you can be a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things passed away. Everything is made new. So I challenge you today. This isn't about don't get angry. This is about when you do, know that you have a way to process it safely. But you know, if you're not saved, It won't do you any good to adjust your anger or fix your anger because ultimately you're probably dealing with a pride issue that you've not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. You know, I was thinking about the Titanic, the unsinkable ship. How how many people in life feel like they're just unsinkable? I got this. This is my life. I'm in control. And yet one moment happens and Our life's out of control. The thing that really upsets me about that whole event wasn't just necessarily the unpreparedness, the lack of training, the lack of lifeboats, and and, and the arrogance of the, the manufacturer and the designers and all of that. It was also the people that were in charge on the ship because they just let people go on the ship just believing a lie that everything's okay. Yeah, we hit a... We hit something, but we're okay. And everybody's just, they're on the deck and they've got their beautiful stoles on and their coats and they they, they hear the music playing. Meanwhile, they're just gonna be minutes away from living the rest of their life in that frigid water before they die. Because they they just didn't wanna panic people. How many people have gone to religious services year after year. They they were sprinkled as a child. They went through special classes to be confirmed, but yet it has nothing to do with what the Word of God says. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. 
He didn't come to give you a little life preserver. He come to put you on his ship that is unsinkable. See, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you will confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart, that Jesus is your Lord, you will be saved. So I, I don't care if you check mark a little box on a card at church and said, I wanted Jesus today. Is it in here? Did it change you? Religion doesn't help anybody. It's just man's barrier to keep you from God. But Jesus came to give you life. He's given his own life. So today, this is what we're going to do. If you want to be born again or you need to surrender your life to God, maybe you've been on the wrong ship too long and you want to come home, you want to surrender your life to Jesus, bow your heads with me, close your eyes, and I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. Clap my hand. And if that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Here it is. One, two, raise it and hold it up. Three, if that's you. Yes, I see that hand. 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 Who else? Who else? Anyone in the back? Yes, I see that hand. Anyone else? Yes, I see that hand. Yes, I see that hand. Yes, I see that hand. Now, I want to give you reality. I want to give you reality. Raising your hand doesn't save you. It says, I want to be saved. So let's be biblical about this. I think we should do what God says. This is what Jesus said. He said, if you acknowledge me before others, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. If you deny me before others, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. I'm gonna ask you to take a very bold and brave step. In just a moment, I'm gonna ask everybody to stand, and if that's you and you raised your hand and you want to be saved, but now you want to get saved and you're going to get saved, I'm gonna invite you to come and stand up here and face me at the altar because I wanna meet you and we're gonna pray together collectively to invite Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now your heart should be beating out of your chest. This is the best decision of your life. Don't turn your back on God. You said, I want to get saved. Now let's get saved. Everybody stand. And if you raise your hand, I want you to come up here right now. Go ahead. Come up here right now. If you raise your hand, come up right here. If you raise your hand, come up. Be bold, be brave. All right. Today we're gonna pray a prayer. I'm just gonna say the words, but what I want you to do is own it. Confessing Jesus. It's one thing to believe, that's acknowledging truth, but to confess is to take ownership publicly. Just like two people take vows publicly when they get married. They have to say, I do. They have to say something publicly. Jesus wants you to publicly confess him today. So we're going to say this prayer. I'll say the words. We're going to pray with those that are watching online. So let's say this together, church. Heavenly Father, come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sin. Today, I ask that your son, Jesus, will come into my heart and live in me. Forgive me of all my sins and live in me as I live for you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen.